Hi, everyone. This presentation is an old discussion is being recorded. Your comments and video will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Um, my name is Ala Marchenko, and I'm a president, the president and executive co-director of the API. And before we get started, I would like to turn it over to my fellow executive, executive co-director, John Smithin and Vice President Technology, Ronan Grunberg. Welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Alla. Now I'm gonna share the screen because I've got the slides. Can everyone see me? Yes. Uh, for some reason, I can't see myself. You don't have to. Oh, it's a shame though, Alla. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> never... No, I don't want that. <laughs> That's okay. Right. right. Um, uh, okay. Anyway, so so so, so let's go. Um, so if you if um, if you look at our first slide and then at our uh, second slide, that second slide you know has the. Uh, um, on it, the logo of the uh, Big Issue newspaper, which uh, has to do with um, the uh, campaign against uh, homelessness. Uh, Mark Peacock, you probably remember those guys in Cambridge. You know, they would never let you get into the uh, Sainsbury's uh, department store without, you know, contributing, right? Anyway, so we've appropriated this, I'm afraid. Uh, the expropriators, the expropriated have once again been ex expropriated. Um, there's also um, Raphael's famous painting, um, The School uh, of Athens. And the second slide talks about the so-called war between, you know, uh, Plato and Aristotle. Um, now, obviously the notion of a war between Plato and Aristotle is hyperbole, of course. Plato was actually Aristotle's teacher and Aristotle spent 17 years in Plato's uh, academy. Um, mm -hmm. Personally close and obviously had many ideas uh, in common. However, there's a very real sense in which they gave rise to two different uh, tendencies in philosophy, which have persisted uh, to the present day. And moreover, it seems that those two tendencies might give rise to very different orientations in terms of our attitude uh, to science, ethics, politics, and so on, and therefore ultimately uh, to the type of society in which we might live, or <laughs> to take into account uh, current conditions, be forced to live. Um, you know, Plato, as is well known, was a totalitarian in politics, uh, CF uh, the Republic, whereas Aristotle in the Nicomachean ethics and the politics was much more nuanced and humanist to use a somewhat anachronistic term in his um, ethics and politics. So I think that Ronan would like to take up this idea and particularly perhaps to explain uh, in particular how terms such as idealist and realist uh, in philosophy differ from the way that they're used uh, in ordinary life. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, so as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, the term uh, idealism and realism in philosophy is very different or it means something very different than the colloquial use of idealism and realism. Uh, so when I was telling my dad many years ago that I wanted to study philosophy, he said, you're just an idealist, mockingly, uh, meaning essentially, you know, your head's up in the clouds and, you know, you're not thinking straight, you really need to be more of a realist. Um, and often colloquially, the terms are used uh, that way, realist and uh, idealist. But in, in philosophy, um, as you, I'm sure a lot of you already know, um, the terms mean something very different. So Plato is um, associated with idealism and Aristotle is associated with realism. So what is the difference between the two things? 
Well, essentially, Plato uh, argued that in order to have any knowledge, uh, in order to know anything, you have to be guided by some ideal archetype, an exemplar. Um, and the reason he said that is because the things in the world of experience are constantly changing. And he, and he said, well, if things are constantly changing in the world of experience, how can you know anything? Because as soon as you think you know something, it's already something else. Now, this is the old Heracletian argument. Uh, Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic, made the point, I'm really kind of simplifying it, but he made the point that the only thing that we know for sure, the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. Change is the fundamental reality in, in the world. And, and therefore, um, it gives rise to a, a problem in knowledge because everything is changing constantly. And so how can you actually know anything? Well, Plato's argument is that um, the way you know something is by way of ideal forms, uh, archetypes that are universal and do not change change. He argued that there, there are such things, and those universals are actually the things that cause, give qualities to things in the world of experience. So when you see something that is beautiful, or when you see something that is black, those, those things correspond to the form beautiful and black. If you see a horse in a triangle, um, the horse corresponds to the form horse and the triangle corresponds to the form triangle. And those things exist in a trans transcendent, unchanging, immutable, timeless reality. They exist outside of space and time, according to Plato. Um, so something has the properties that it has because it participates in a particular form. The form gives it its identity. Now, this is a long preamble. The way this is related to idealism is because Plato says that um, the only way we can actually come to know the forms is through our mind. The forms don't exist in the world of experience. The forms are also the epistemological goal that we have because they represent what is real. The things in experience are mere shadows. They are poor examples of the ideal. And the reason they're poor examples is because they come into being, they last for a time, and then they fade away. They're imperfect. The forms are perfect, unchanging, and universal. And the only way that one can know the forms is through the mind. So that very quickly puts Plato in the category of an idealist because he believes that ideas are fundamental to knowledge. The only way you can know anything is by way of an idea. Experience may lead you to an idea, but experience is not the true path to knowledge. And there are forms of knowledge that are not based on experience at all, like mathematics, for example. Mathematics is non-corporeal. So according to Plato, because forms are changeless, they possess a higher degree of reality than things in the world, which are changeable and always coming into being and going out of existence. And so the task for philosophy, says Plato, is to discover through reason, through the mind, the nature of forms, which are the true reality, and the interrelations of the forms.
So this is why Plato in Raphael's painting is pointing up to the heavens. Aristotle, by, in contrast, is, is pointing uh, downward because Aristotle rejected Plato's theory of forms um, in terms of them being transcendent. He didn't reject the forms, but he says that forms don't exist apart from things. He says they are imminent. They exist in things. Okay, so there is no such thing, according to Aristotle, as formless matter or matterless form. Form and matter intertwined, and they are a part of each other. And, and knowledge comes by way of looking at objects in experience and trying to understand their essence, their nature, their form. Yeah, so Ron, could, could we put it this way, actually, um, to kind of sum up? Yeah, I'm Again. done. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, I, I, you know, if again, if we look at the detail in, in Raphael's pa uh, painting, as you say, Plato, um, he is supposed to be some real person, of course, in the race arts as well, I forget which one, but, but Plato is pointing up to the heavens, not literally the heavens, because unlike Raphael, of course, he was a, he was a pagan, but I'm going to use like, you know, four words, um, it, it's obviously meant to represent the ideal the spiritual, the ethereal, the transcendental, which is a term that we're going to use, you know, later in sure. some sense. On the other hand, um, Aristotle is pointing down to the ground, you know, down to earth, to practical reality and so forth. So, Ala, do you want to open up the discussion? Absolutely, John. Uh, so those three slides we here to discuss and please if anyone has any comments, questions, and statements, please unmute yourself and uh, put your hand up. Yeah, should I stop the share, Ala? Yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. No, no, uh, let me repeat. Re go to reactions in the bottom of your screen and there's gonna be a yellow hand and please press that it's gonna be like like a raise your hand if you see that um it's yeah so i see john cummins first figured it out so john cummins please unmute yourself and ask your questions oh i i i noticed that uh in the in the beginning there john referred to Plato as a, well, it was similar to fascist. What was the term? Totalitarian, I said, yeah. A totalitarian. Yeah. Is that a, an opinion or a fact? Um, well, it's in the Republic, right? The, 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 um, the, the type of society that he advocates is a totalitarian society. It's basically based on um, Sparta, right? You know, Sparta had defeated Athens, you know, so Plato came to the conclusion, you know, to democracy isn't cool, you know, we should organize things a bit more like uh, Sparta, and we'll be okay, right? That, that's the kind of idea. Well, I mean, the, other, the other thing, John, is that Plato was very much um, interested in the philosopher king, and the philosopher king is, is that person who has the capacity to... Um, connect with the forms to have an understanding of the forms. But he also said that, you know, this is not something that everyone can do. And um, in a democracy, you know, we tend to um, uh, elect people who are not particularly um, intelligent in terms of their understanding of, of the nature of reality. You want somebody who's, who's got an, an insight into what is true who, uh, to lead a state. And that would be the philosopher king. And that's why he argued that, you know, not anyone can be a leader. You want to get the right leader. And that leader would be a philosopher. Yeah, so, t t t uh, yeah, it's not such a negative uh, view of, of uh, that, that we have a very negative view of totalitarianism. I mean, people like, like Stalin and, and other political entities. Plato was trying to be a benevolent dictator philosopher. Is that what you're saying? 
I, I think he would see it that for the way. good of society, yeah. not for the good of himself. Totalitarian, uh, totalitarianism is often associated with uh, control, right? And just um, yeah, a, uh, a selfish desire for a, a ruthless desire for power. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Plato sees it that way. I think for Plato, um, it's it's the uh, enlightened person who is given the role of leading because that person will make the, the best decisions and, and the most righteous and virtuous decisions for uh, a society. Um, in, in a democracy, uh, the problem is that um, it's, it's really uh, a popularity contest. So, you know, if you have charisma, if you've got a certain demeanor about you, you may be elected, but you will possibly be elected for the wrong reasons. And, um, you, you know, the intellect is the, the right sort of uh, reason to elect somebody because they've got a virtuous mind, a virtuous heart, and they are going to take society to a place that is good. They're going to lead it to the, to the good. Um, uh, and so I think- May, uh, may I, think, I just interject? I'm really glad that uh, our friend Leah Taylor Roy, our local MP, who's <laughs> usually a member of this group is not here today. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I agree with that because uh, I mean, it's, it's very vulnerable. Uh, Plato's ideas are very vulnerable to, uh, yeah. to corruption. Um, but I think that in his mind, it was uh, an ideal f form of, of rule. Um, not that, I mean, I, th I think we've discounted that it's not, that it's not a good uh, way to run a society. And we live in a democracy and it works very well yeah. for the most part with a few corruptions here and there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it generally actually works. How, okay. do you take the hand, how do you take the hand down? Is my hand down now? Uh, it is up. I think you can figure it out. Or I can try to figure it out, but you can try to. It's in reactions, John. Oh, it says lower hand. Yeah, I see that. Okay, I see Henry now. So Henry, you can say it. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering. Um, in my, in my... Uh, no, Henry, your microphone is off. You mute it again. Okay. Yes, that's better. And speak louder, please. And, and then my understanding, uh, looking at Plato's theory, uh, my understanding is uh, it's a pure totalitarian thing. Because to elect, to elect. The word elect belongs to, the, to democracy. So let's say to choose uh, the person, the most the most, uh, I don't know how to classify, intelligent, enlightened, uh, all other people don't. How do we do it? It's, it's a total absurd. It's not possible. It's a pure no. fascism or if, if more communism, if you wish. So uh, this is, uh, to, to me, it's, uh, Plato, Plato's ideology has been used by totalitarian regimes quite successfully. So, and uh, this. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a very, yeah, it's a very difficult thing to, to do, uh, uh, to choose a, a leader that actually conforms to the Platonic ideal. It's a ridiculous concept. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Henry. Uh, but I think that Plato's politics has been pretty much discounted, and I'm not going to argue against that. I, I think that the uh, philosopher king ideal ruling um, a nation is, is very vulnerable to totalitarianism and fascism. Another thing I'd like to say, um, let's, let's look at the democracy. Democracy is like a leader, a vote to simplify, but how do the ordinary person, how does the ordinary person know the quality of this particular leader on relying on mass media? The information information delivered uh, through the um, know, social nets or TV. Can we say, 
confidently that the decision made by the ordinary individual is really based on reality or influenced by the amount of information and, and in many occasions totally biased delivered to him. You want to take that one or do you, do you want me to take that one? No, take, take it. Uh, no, I, I, I completely agree with you, Henry. Um, I, I think that um, we don't really have a direct uh, impression of the people that we vote into office. It's always um, given to us, you know, through a third party, through screens, through media, uh, and it's very well. Um, um, it's 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 uh, you know it's finely tuned. You know, anyone who wants to run for office uh, has a very uh, particular narrative uh, written for them or they, are, they act according to a particular narrative. We don't really know, but actually in the end, um, you know, proof is in the pudding in a way. You know, when somebody takes office, if, if, they, if they have good intentions, if they have a good leadership style, and, and if they think rationally and well, they're gonna do well. They're gonna, be, they're gonna become popular and, and hopefully they'll do a good job. Um, and, and sometimes we don't even know if they did a good job when they get out of office. It takes years to actually decide whether they did a good job or not, um, you know, to, to make a decision on that. Exactly. There are too many ifs and uh, we never know. So I just, it's very difficult to classify what we have uh, on the head, maybe. Maybe we had 50 years ago, but uh, not, not uh, the last 20, 30 years. Uh, can classify it as a democracy because uh, there is no informative decision being made by individual who votes. Everything yeah. is influenced and uh, well. So in this case, we can't even claim what's the best, uh, the best. Uh, uh, we have um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, again, uh, you know, the politics side of Plato, uh, John brought that in. But it's really a distinct thing from the epistemology, from um, his idealism and Plato's realism. Um, and may I just say, Henry? Uh, that, sorry, not Henry. Um, thanks, Henry, for for what you said, um, Ronan. I think the point is not so much, you know, what Plato believed in the Republic and what you know Aristotle believed in you know, in the politics and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, that's all pretty old. The more important point, the idea of this, you know, long sweep of philosophy, do the kind of ideas that Plato championed ultimately lead to totalitarianism, regardless of his own opinion, uh, you know, and do, uh, it's dubious in, in the case of Aristotle, but do the ideas that Aristotle have ultimately lead to, um, uh, you know, a more desirable kind of society. I think that's the main point. Not specifically, you know, what did Plato think or what did Aristotle think. Um, I think, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, turn it back to I, I, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll answer that. I won't answer it now. I think we should oh. go on. But I, at some point, I will get to that uh, yeah. to answer that question and what I think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm I, I think I think uh, Howard is next. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I think I'm back on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm sifting through my brain to remember what I know about this stuff. And I think um, I'm trying to recall of what, Pla what Plato says about the relationship between the objects of perception and the objects of the intellect or the, the ideal forms and the material objects. So I know at some point he says they, uh, material objects participate in the form or partake of the form. And I'm wondering, you know, how that works on, let's say the level of, you know, ideal hoarseness and the material horse in front of that. So what exactly does it mean for a material object to participate in a form? Like presumably the forms come first and yes. um, are a priori, and then mm -hmm. the actual horse is an imperfect manifestation of the ideal horse. So, 
I'm trying to think aside from the idea really that maybe God creates all things and there's a sort of divine author and, you know, the earthly horse is a secondary copy of some divine creation or maybe a secularized version of that. I'm trying to see how the material objects partake of the forms and how the forms are a priori, especially when it comes to hoarseness as opposed to, let's say, a triangle. Well, Howard, that's a really excellent question. Um, in fact, it is probably the question uh, that Aristotle posed to Plato at some point or other. Uh, where did Howard go? He just disappeared. Oh, I should still be here. I took my Oh, there you out. are. Okay, yeah, you, you moved. It's like, okay. I feel like it's a checkerboard. Everybody's moving back. Um, so, um, um, as you said, the forms are a priori. So they are eternal. You know, Plato believed that the universe always existed and always will exist, that it's eternal and that the forms are universals that always have existed. But to your point or your question, well, how do particulars partake of the forms? That, that is a logical problem. And in fact, Aristotle pointed out that there are a number of logical issues with Plato's uh, transcendent forms. One, one simple question that he posed was, well, he posed what has come to be known as the problem of charismos. The problem of charismos is, is the problem of separation. You know, if the forms exist in a transcendent reality, but objects in the material world partake of those transcendent forms, how do, how do the forms actually cause that participation do they actually come into the sort of world that is changing and and that where time exists or do material objects somehow you know ascend to the transcendent reality and partake of the form um so this became a problem it was the problem of separation and it was one of the problems that aristotle pointed out and, and that's why Aristotle basically argued that forms don't exist independent of material objects. They are within material objects. They're imminent in the objects. Now, having said that, there's actually not a huge difference between Plato and Aristotle because both of them are dualists. Both of them believe in matter and form. It's just that their emphasis is different. Uh, Aristotle simply says, we don't need to have forms be transcendent. We can have the forms be inside objects of experience. And if you look at enough objects of experience, you will eventually get a, an understanding of the form of the object that you're looking at. You will get to see its essence, its identity, what makes it what it is right? It's nature. You'll, you'll discover it by looking at enough objects of experience. So, you know, I don't want to get into the, the details because I mean, it can get a little heady, but, you know, this is why Plato is often considered to be a deductive thinker because he starts with general sort of forms and sort of moves to particulars. He starts from general and moves to particulars, but Aristotle is kind of the other way around. He starts with particulars and moves, moves to the general. So inductive versus deductive. But that's, and it's a good question though. Like, you know, it's a, it's a good point, Howard, that you make. Okay, thank you, Ronan. So we have one more hand from George. George, please unmute yourself, but it's gonna be last one in this section because we have to mo move to the next slide. So George, okay. your last question for this part. Okay, I'll, I'll be sure just say, I think it would be good. If you can just call it. Uh, we cannot hear you properly, George. Can you possibly define more precisely uh, what is a realist, what is realist and what is actually idealist? Because as you don't mentioned, so um, the, the forms 
in Plato's ideal system forms exist in a transcendental reality, is that already another form of reality, hence another form of realism, just not necessarily material idealism, yeah. surrealism. So, in fact, are we talking about the distinction between material realism as opposed to uh, <clears throat> ideal realism? Because even what things that we cannot perceive, we sometimes have to rely on methods and, and other modes of perception, uh, uh, let's say instruments. So uh, whether it's a microscope or mediascope to find some information, uh, obviously very distant media is also just another tool of perception. Um, yeah, can I answer that, George? Um, actually, uh, the, we'll come back to these issues. The, the issues you raised are very important, you know, about epistemology and everything. But the idea is that we'll discuss these things later on, you know, about types of realism and so on and so forth. Like uh, this was meant to be just an introductory thing. Is that OK? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think that's fine, and we move into the section yeah, two. Yeah, yes. Alla, before we go on, I, I, I just had an email from Brenda Spartan, who wants to have the link sent her. Can you do that? Her email is bspotten at yourq .ca. Uh, Can you send it in the... Um, can you text me because, like, I'm yeah. sure. Text me her email, I will. No, and I just sent it already. You did it already. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I was going to ask you because you have a York one anyway, right? Yeah, that's good. Oh, I got a York lots of things. Yep. Um, okay. We, we won't go. So, Alice, so she want me to share the screen again? And Yes. And we yeah, yeah. move into the section two. Yeah. And the name of this section, the philosophical order, going to be slides four to eight. And Oh, John yeah. Smith is going to start this section. Um, and please welcome John. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you.